Welcome and thank you for standing by. For the duration of today's conference, all parties will have an open line. If you are not speaking, please either utilize the mute feature on your phone or you may press star six to mute and unmute your line. I would like to inform all parties that today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn the conference over to Ms. Pamela Maxwell. Thank you, you may begin. Hello, on behalf of the International Society for Quality of Life Research and the National Cancer Institute, I would like to welcome you to the webinar series, Best Practices for Integrating Patient-Reported Outcomes in Oncology Clinical Trials. The webinar series is comprised of six webinars, each approximately 45 minutes in length. The webinars are designed to be viewed independently to meet the individual learning needs of the participants, or the series can be viewed sequentially in its entirety. Today's webinar is the sixth in the series and is titled, How to Report Patient-Reported Outcome Findings from Clinical Trials, presented by Dr. Michael Brundage and Dr. Melanie Calvert. I will now turn it over to them. Thank you. Thank you very much and welcome to our webinar. My name is uh, Professor Michael Brundage. I'm a professor of oncology and of epidemiology at Queen's University in Kingston, Canada. And I co-chair the Equality of Life Committee of the Canadian NCIC Clinical Trials Group. I'd like to turn it over now to Dr. Calvert to introduce herself. Thanks, Mike. Um, I'm Mel Calvert. I'm Professor of Outcomes Methodology at the University of Birmingham in the UK. I lead the Patient Reported Outcomes Research Group here at Birmingham, undertaking a program of work with international collaborators aiming to enhance the design, implementation, and analysis and reporting of pros in trials, and crucially to improve the way that pro results are used to inform clinical care. And I'm a member of the International Society for Quality of Life Research at Board of Directors. Both Mike and I are co-chairs of the ISOCOR Best Practices for Pros in Trial Task Force, and one major output from this task force is the Consult Pro Extension, which is the subject of today's webinar. Next slide, please. So in today's session, we will start by considering the importance of high-quality patient-reported outcome data from trials and the current limitations in reporting. We will then describe the development of the Consult Pro Extension which aims to promote the transparent reporting of pro data from trials to inform patient care. Finally, we'll conclude the webinar by considering implementation of Consult Pro in practice and identify areas for future research. By way of background and as a reminder, a patient reported outcome, or PRO, is any report of the status of a patient's health condition that comes directly from the patient without interpretation of the patient's response by a clinician or anyone else. So this can include things like health-related quality of life, health utilities, or symptoms such as pain or fatigue. And these are commonly collected using questionnaires during a clinical trial. Next slide, please. So I think this quote by Jeff Sloan really encapsulates the ethos of the ISOCOR task force and the view of my team here at Birmingham perfectly. So we must do all that we can to make patient reported outcome assessment feasible and credible. If we fail in our task, then we've left out the heart of all healthcare research, the patient. Okay, so I'm now going to hand over to Mike to just talk through some of the issues around the importance of patient reported outcomes and why they're valued so much by patients. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mel. I'm going to begin this section by addressing two important premises shown here on this slide. First, as you've heard in many presentations of this webinar series, patient-reported outcomes can indeed be evaluated using valid measures and valid analytical techniques. Reporting these pros appropriately once they are analyzed is another important aspect of producing valid and interpretable pro results from clinical trials. Further, our premise is that all of this is worth doing properly, if you will. 
as there is abundant evidence that patients and their clinicians generally value information about the quality of life implications of illness and its treatment. Next, please. There's a great deal of literature that focuses on this last premise, but an example here is provided by Hassan and colleagues who did a systematic review of the literature published in the Annals of Oncology. This team from the Netherlands concluded that patients with fulfilled information needs and patients who experience less information barriers in general have a better quality of life themselves, less anxiety and depression. So the importance of generating valid pros from clinical trials to inform patients is a critical part of good quality care. Next, please. In summary, then, the importance of and the value of pro-information from clinical trials is to inform patients about the clinical trial outcomes, which may in turn inform their uh, personal preferences for uh, interventions. Pros have several dimensions of added value in this sense. They provide information regarding the beneficial or adverse impacts of treatments from patients' perspective and can help inform choice in that way. Pros can also be useful in informing care of the individual patient in developing clinical practice guidelines based on pro-evidence across studies and can provide prognostic information that has been shown to be independent from other conventional uh, sources of prognostication such as ECOG performance statements. This too can be incorporated into the design of clinical trials, for instance, as a stratification factor. I'm going to ask Mel now to continue with uh, discussing usable and integrated data on the next slide. Thanks, Mike. So I think we all recognize the value of pre-oro data, and it's really most useful when the rationale for the pro-assessment is being clearly defined and appropriate domains identified within a, a clinical trial. And when we're reporting these data, it's really crucial that they're presented in the context of other important clinical outcomes, so in the context of survival data or toxicity data. And this is really crucial in helping informing the decisions that Mike's just described. Next slide, please. So this example in the Journal of Clinical Oncology, I think is quite nicely um, shows us the quality of life benefits associated with the treatment in the context of, of the survival of the patients. And so I think this is one way that you could present uh, quality of life data alongside survival data within a publication. However, this isn't always the case, and so I'm going to hand back over to Mike now to describe the current reporting practices which occur within trials. Um, next slide, please. Thanks, Mel. So, so far we've discussed that pros can be determined using valuable and reliable methods and can inform clinical use of the clinical trial results. A significant problem arises, however, when pro data from clinical trials are not reported well. Several studies have shown that current reporting of pro data is often suboptimal in quality, and that this poor quality can undermine the optimal clinical use of these data. From a research ethics perspective, poorly executed or poorly reported results are not only wasteful, but are also unethical. Next slide. This graph summarizes findings of a recent systematic review of the quality of PRO reporting in almost 800 randomized clinical trials across a wide spectrum of medical conditions. The bars on this chart represent the proportion of trials that met each quality indicator for various aspects of per reporting. Obviously, the longer the bar, the better. While most reports indicated validity of the measure used, only some trials discussed the quality of life findings in the context of other outcome measures, as Mel has just alluded to and only about half of the trials provided a rationale for the instrument or, used a or, or stated a hypothesis regarding the clinical trials outcomes. So the clarity that we hope to achieve in, report in designing and reporting these trials is not realized in a great number of trials that are currently published. Next, please. As mentioned earlier, this variation and this lack of quality can have a negative impact on clinicians' use of pro data in practice. This slide shows data from a mixed qualitative quantitative study of 30 experienced oncologists in two cancer centers in Canada. As shown on this slide, many clinicians reported a reasonably good understanding of the concept of quality of life as measured in clinical trials, 
shown here by the blue bars generally to the left of neutral. Next slide. These data, however, show that the same experienced oncologists often do not feel comfortable interpreting quality of life data from these clinical trials, as illustrated by the red bars, with many to the right of the neutral response. Some clinicians also feel the need to improve their use of ProData in practice, as shown by the green bars to the left of neutral. Next, please. Further explanation of barriers and facilitators to the use of PROS in these clinicians include their concerns about the generalizability of PROS, that is, are the right measures being used for the patients and treatments in my practice. Also, clinicians expressed a lack of understanding of, the, of many of these measures and a lack of clinical practice time in seeking out PRO results from clinical trials when not included with the primary clinical trial report. Next, please. So what would help address some of these ver uh, barriers? Clinicians indicated in the study that several things would be of assistance to them. First, publishing PRO simultaneously with the other outcomes and not in a separate publication would be useful, as would use the use of consistent reporting formats, provision of a succinct summary of the clinical trial's implications, and more consistent reporting standards for PROs would all contribute to facilitating clinicians' uptake and use of PRO data in clinical practice. Mel is now going to continue with a discussion of the Consort PRO extension. Thanks, Mike. So I think Mike's clearly demonstrated here that the quality of PRO data from trials is often suboptimal, and this really limits the use of these valuable data in informing patient care. And I agree with Mike's position that this is really maybe viewed as research waste, and that it's unethical to ask patients to complete a large number of questionnaires within trials if the data are not, not then presented in a meaningful way to inform patient care. So at Isoqual, and within my team here at Birmingham, our research is really focused on improving this. And one aspect is to ensure transparent reporting of pro data from trials. So Mike and myself um, led a, the Isoqual Reporting Guidelines Task Force, which really aimed to try and address this. Now, you may be familiar with the consort guidance. This provides evidence-based guidance for the transparent reporting of clinical trials generally. But this also has a number of extensions available, and you, we have the web link here on the slide um, for those of you that are interested, which provides guidance on how to report um, data from different types of trials, for example, cluster trials, or different types of data, such as harms. But what we felt um, at the time when we de developed the Consult Pro extension was that there was insufficient guidance relating to pros, and as such, valuable pro data was being omitted in trial publications. Um, sometimes pro data has been published in a secondary publication many years after the primary publication of the trial, or was simply not included at all. So ISOQOL, in collaboration with a range of international stakeholders, led the development of the Consult Pro extension. And this really aimed, as I said, to develop, uh, improve the transparent reporting of pros in trials. This is a partnership with a number of stakeholders. So existing members of the consult group and the consult executive, including Doug Altman and David Marr, but also policymakers, experts in patient reported outcomes, patient advocates, funders, regulators, journal editors, trialists. Next slide, please. So the consult pro extension um, followed the equator guidance um, for how to develop this sort of um, method. And it started by establishing the current literature base. And Mike has shown the example of establishing what the current reporting practices were within trials. And um, that also gave some recommendations of the sort of things that we would view as good quality indicators. We then undertook a survey of key stakeholders and invited comments and feedback. And this is an iterative process with a number of stages and repeated surveys and, and um, reviewing the feedback that was obtained and developing further proposed standards on which we invited further comments and feedback. This was the, the results of this um, iterative process, this Delphi process, were taken forward then to a consensus meeting at which um, key stakeholders, as I've mentioned previously, attended, um, so representatives for a wide range of groups. 
Next slide, please. So at the consensus meeting, we developed a consort uh, pro extension. And this is for use in conjunction with the official consort 2010 statement and related extensions appropriate for the trial design. The Consult Pro extension ultimately ended up with five additional checklist items that should be used in addition to the Consult 2010 statement. And we also developed um, elaboration of existing checklist items as applied to the reporting of pros in trials. And crucially, these extensions and elaborations should be reported in trials where pros are a primary or a key secondary outcome. Next slide, please. So this work, which was published in JAMA in 2013, um, here we have the five extension items listed. So the pro should be identified in the abstract, the primary or secondary outcome. The pro hypothesis should be stated in relevant domains identified, if applicable. The evidence of pro instrument validity and reliability should be provided or cited, if available. And statistical approaches for dealing with missing data should be explicitly stated. And finally, in the discussion, the pro-specific limitations and implications for generalizability of study findings and clinical practice should be described. And we're going to take each of these five extensions and look at them in more detail in a moment. Um, but for those of you that are interested, next slide, please. Um, in this work, we would refer you um, to our paper in JAMA. And this gives examples of real-life practice from trials of how these extensions have been used. It also gives much more detail on the elaborations and, again, provides useful examples and the rationale for each of these extensions and elaborations. So um, this paper has been cited over 80 times to date, and I think it's getting increasing recognition, so we'd really encourage its uptake. Um, Mike, I'm going to hand over to you now to just talk us through the first few of these extensions in a bit more detail. Thanks. Next slide, please. Thanks, Mel. So we won't uh, dwell on each of these extensions in great deal, detail, but we want to mention each one to make sure each is uh, clear to the attendees of today's webinar. The first extension is that the pro should be identified in the abstract. It should also be specified whether it's a primary or secondary outcome in the abstract. The reason for this uh, is to facilitate indexing and identification of studies to inform clinical care and evidence synthesis. It can be quickly determined from a literature search whether the PRO is a primary or secondary outcome if this extension is met. Obviously, the implication for the design is that the status of the outcome needs to be specified in the protocol, but we generally assume that's the case. Uh, the important point here is to report it in the abstract appropriately. Next, please. The second extension is that the PRO hypothesis should be stated and relevant domains identified if applicable. The reason for this uh, extension uh, is uh, that we are all aware of um, doing multiple statistical testing on patient reported outcome data, given that there are many domains available, many time points of analysis available, and it's so easy to fall into the trap, if you will, of finding a significant result and reporting that result. The pre-specification of a hypothesis, the right domains, and the right timing is important to minimize uh, the impact, the negative impact of multiple statistical testing and to make clear that the trial is designed appropriately in order to, in order to address the clinically relevant hypotheses. Over to you, Mel. Thanks, Mike. So the next extension is that the evidence of pro-instrument validity and reliability should be provided or cited, if available. Now, we know that there are over 800 different patient reported outcome measures available for use within trials. Um, there will be some common ones, so in a cancer setting, um, the FACT questionnaires or the URTC questionnaires are often used. But what we need to make sure is that whatever questionnaire has been chosen is appropriate um, for the population and the study, um, that there's a clear rationale for its use, and that it's valid and reliable in the population of interest and for the language um, that it's being used in. And if it's an electronic PRO, that's also valid and reliable in that format as well. And the rationale for this really is that the trials to provide robust PRO data um, that can then inform clinical practice, we need to make sure that it's a valid, reliable PRO that has been used. Now, given that there are so many measures available, the implications for the trial design um, 
interested trialists might find these websites that are listed at the bottom of this slide particularly useful. So the ProQuality database, for example, um, has information on the validity and reliability of a wide range of instruments and provides references on these issues um, and gives further details on the psychometric properties. Um, for those that are also interested in psychometric properties more generally, the Cosmin checklist provides a useful resource to evaluate existing tools um, and also is a good resource for identifying evidence from other trials for the population of interest. Uh, next slide, please. So the next extension um, is around the statistical approaches for dealing with missing data should be explicitly stated and um, identified. Now we know from work by Fielding et al. that the level of missing data from trials relating to pros is often very high. And we need to report this because it has great implications for the way that we interpret the PRO data from studies. Um, and because missing data within trials and particularly PRO data is often informative, it could potentially bias the trial results if we don't know how much missing data there was and what the causes of missing data were. So we would recommend that the levels of missing data should therefore be reported either within a table or in the text or possibly in the consult flow chart if, that, if that's convenient. Um, I think we weren't really very prescriptive in, in the Consult Pro extension as to how this should occur, but simply that it should be reported somewhere in the main trial publication. Um, the implications for the trial design in relation to missing data is that we really need to consider ways to maximize compliance, and this can include things such as staff training, making sure that patients are involved in the selection of instruments at the start and the optimization of trial processes, and that how missing data is going to be managed within the trial should be then pre-specified through data collection processes, but also in the statistical analysis plan. And these issues will be touched upon elsewhere in the webinar series. Uh, next slide, please. So the final um, extension is that pro-specific limitations and implications for the generalizability of study findings should be reported. So. The reason for this particular extension is that readers need to be able to assess the generalizability of the PRO data and any potential sources of bias. So pro-specific limitations may, for example, include whether particular groups of patients were excluded due to language requirements or whether there were high levels of missing data or the implications of the PRO results in the context of survival data from the particular trial. So all of these issues need to be described so that we can assess the generalizability of the findings. In terms of trial design, um, we need to consider the pro-specific generalizability at the design stage and think about make, in trying to ensure that the questionnaire is appropriate for the general population, um, that we try and minimize missing data, as I've just said, and that we try and think about the survival and the context of survival right from the design stage of the study. Um, next slide, please. Now, I'm now going to hand over back to Mike uh, to talk about knowledge translation now and how we can optimize reporting in practice. Thanks. Thank you, Mel. So uh, the consort extension provides some guidance, but clearly we still have a great deal of work to do in terms of exploring best practices for knowledge translation and, and implementation of these reporting standards in order to achieve our goal of improved publication reporting. There are several aspects uh, to this knowledge translation challenge, including the variation in clinical contexts across uh, disease uh, types and, uh, and even within oncology across disease sites. Uh, patients and physicians have different preferences for what they wish to see in the publications, and physicians are not used to a standard format, uh, and they're not used to typically seeing pro data included in the main trial publication. So education is required in order to um, help uh, clinicians improve their level of comfort with analysis and interpretation of these data. Clearly, um, standardized presentations and consistent reporting uh, practices should improve that type of understanding. Uh, there's ongoing research addressing how to best format pro data when reported in clinical trials, and lay summaries may also help patients 
integrate the results of clinical trials more effectively in um, their um, decision making, such as through the use of formal decision aids or more informally in educational supplements. I'm going to focus for just a minute on one of these aspects, which is the uh, way that we report da data typically in clinical trials. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide represents the results of a recent survey of over 350 clinical trialists uh, around the world, uh, specifically in Canada, UK, and Australia. The participants in the survey were all oncologists involved with clinical trials and engaged in the clinical trials process. In one section of the survey, we asked clinicians' opinions about how useful a typical plot of average quality of life scores over time by treatment arm would be to them in practice. This slide shows the results of that particular question. As you can see, looking at the dark blue bars, approximately two-thirds of clinicians responded favorably. In other words, thought such a graph would be useful or very useful. Still, a third were less enthusiastic. An interesting finding is that the level of enthusiasm didn't seem to depend on whether the clinicians were uh, practicing oncologists or more engaged in clinical research, and also didn't seem to depend on whether they were trained as medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, or other types of oncologists. This seems to be a fairly universal uh, dispersion of opinions. Next slide, please. This graph looks at the same type of question, only this time exploring whether a graph of the proportion of patients showing a clinically meaningful change would be useful to clinicians. This is often the type of analysis done in a clinical trial where a minimum threshold for clinical improvement is stipulated and the proportion of patients that meet that minimum threshold is reported. Again, some clinicians would find this useful, but about a third were less enthusiastic. And again, this enthusiasm did not seem to matter whether the clinician was trained as a researcher or was a medical radiation or other type of oncologist. So these seem to be some fairly robust opinions uh, that clinicians share, and this uh, creates a challenge for us in terms of uh, implementing the consort extension in an effective way that clinicians will, will find most useful in their clinical practice. Finally, I'm going to turn over once more to Mel to sum up today's webinar. Thanks, Mike. So in summary, I think we hope that you now recognize the importance of ensuring the high quality reporting of pro data from trials. Um, we believe that improved reporting of pros from trials will enable robust evidence to inform patient choice, um, aid clinical decision making, and inform health policy. And we know that active implementation by journals, authors, and reviewers can lead to improved reporting as evidenced by Hopewell and, and the BMJ. So for those of you that are actively involved in peer reviewing or in journal, as journal editors, we'd really hope that you would actively endorse this, this piece of work and try and engage with it. Um, we'd also like people to start to consider how pro data can be used in practice and think about ways, um, such as the example Mike's just given, in terms of how people can look at the data and, and usefully use it to inform p patient decision making. Um, so if you are interested in those areas, then the ISOQOL task force um, is actively working in this area, and we're always looking to engage with uh, researchers that have an interest in this area. As we've mentioned throughout um, the webinar today, reporting isn't the only side of this coin. Um, design of trials is also very important, and the way that we think about pros right at the design stage of a study is essential. To have a clear rationale and hypothesis for their assessment in the first place is crucial. Um, and we've talked about the validity and reliability of instruments and so on. And these topics will be touched upon in a further webinar within the uh, series, so we'd encourage you to, to view that if you have an interest in this area. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so as I've said, uh, reporting is intrinsically related to design, um, and also the FDA guidance provides very useful information on this topic, and we would encourage you to look at this, and also the work of the Spirit Initiative, which is general guidance on um, protocol development for trials. So that's not pro-specific, but it's general guidance for protocol writers. Uh, next slide, please. 
So I think the few final things to say are um, our acknowledgements, really, that this work that we've undertaken as part of the ISOQOL task force um, and on the Consult Pro Extension has been with a range of um, international collaborators. Um, so in particular, we'd really like to thank the ISOQOL uh, members who are part of the Reporting Guidelines Task Force, also the Medical Research Council in the UK, the Hubs for Trials Methodology Research, who provided funding for this work, and the Canadian Institute for Health Research, who also provided funding. Um, the Consul Pro Exec members um, and stakeholders who took part in the consensus meeting. Um, next slide, please. Um, who are listed on this slide. Um, so that concludes today's uh, webinar. Um, as I said, we refer anyone that's interested in this topic to our JAMA paper, um, also to the ISACOR website and to the remaining um, NCI webinars in this series. And uh, we'd like to thank you very much for joining this webinar today. Thanks. That does conclude today's conference. Thank you for participating.